Holy God, we come today with so very many distractions, and so we pray that you help us to set them aside, to settle down our hearts and our minds, that the seed of your word might take root there, that we might know you better, and knowing you better, we might know ourselves better, and that in all of this you may be glorified. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. This set of verses is sometimes known as the story of the hemorrhaging woman or the woman with the issue of blood. It is a delicate story, but it is also a deliberate story, and I invite you to listen for both. Listen now for a word from God. A large crowd followed Jesus and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a woman. She had some issues. Issues with blood for a real long time. And there was Jesus. He had a following, a crowd really, pressed in on him from every which way. And the woman with the bleeding, crept up behind Jesus and touched a wrinkle of his robe, and she became well, like that. And when Jesus called her out, she bowed, and she explained, and he told her to be healed, but she already was. It's a remarkable tale, but when it's stripped down to 11 verses with no names and no backstory, it just blurs into all the other exceptional Jesus happenings. And let's face it, exceptional upon exceptional upon exceptional grows mundane sometimes. If you don't dig beyond the bare bone snippets, What would she say, this woman with no name, so flat upon a word-jammed page? What would she tell us if we dared to get personal? I like to imagine that if her story were told by her, extracted from the monotonous exceptional upon exceptional upon exceptional, that it would take on a life that sounded something like this. I'm never quite sure whether I should be flattered that my story made the collection or perturbed that I'm tossed in without even a mention of my name. It's not so different, really, from the man born blind or the paralytic or the woman who washed Jesus' feet. And honestly, nameless would have been flattering back then. Nameless implies that you are someone, just without the letters to distinguish you from the other someones. But for 12 years, I had been told that I was no one. 
If you could graduate grade school and all the time I spent being nobody, scum, untouchable, being nameless, at least that was something. The scriptures are so polite in the ways that they tell my story these days. The hemorrhaging woman, as if I was bleeding from a head wound or a bullet hole, but they don't make you live on the outskirts of town for a bullet hole. They don't call you dirty for a bullet hole. And the woman with an issue of blood, huh, that's my favorite, so polite. Yes, I would call it an issue. It was an issue that I wasn't allowed in the temple because folks like me, the ones with the intimate kind of bleeding that we talk about in delicate, vague, lady terms instead of what it was, something like uterine cancer, bleeding that brings its own special terror, we couldn't go to church because we might infect others with our dirtiness. Twelve years of doctors, twelve years of no answers, of potential public embarrassment, of being denied to my house of worship, twelve years of getting worse and worse and worse. So, yeah, when I heard that Jesus was going to be in town, I touched the hem of his robe. They make it sound so easy like I just shimmied up through the crowd, and shazam, I was good as new, but when you're untouchable, nothing is easy. I wasn't so far from dead as far as I know, but I risked what was left of my life that day. So long as I stayed on the edges with the other cast-offs, I could kind of go about my limited business, but step into healthy society, and I was more than a nuisance, more than a public health risk. I was so grotesque. No, I was seen as so grotesque that I might make you unacceptable to God if you just breathed the same air as me. And that made me a liability. That made me disposable. So I didn't just saunter up to Jesus, didn't just reach out and brush his robe. I didn't just anything. This was an act of rebellion. Reaching out required everything of me, the complete abandonment of my modesty, a risking of my freedom, maybe my life, and the purity of all of those people if I believed that stuff. And some days I did. The purity of all those people who just might brush my elbow as they followed Jesus from lakeside to hillside. I rebelled against the world's diagnosis that I was trash. And I diagnosed myself as worth the risk. I diagnosed Jesus as worth the risk. Like the skinny kid standing up to a bully or the civil rights advocate facing the firing hose, like volunteering for tribute, I rebelled. Maybe it's not rebellion like you've known, noisy and obvious, but rebellion often starts softly and the quiet act of reaching down to pull the underdog back to her feet. And the first whispers of, that's a lie, or we're supposed to have no other gods. And the ginger touch of an unremarkable swatch of fabric. Rebellion starts quietly sometimes. It's true that my fingertips barely grazed the hem of his robe. It was quick, but... Not like you think, not about timidity or shame, it was about hope. It just needs one minute to be realized. Hope like a love-bitten child on the playground giving an unexpected peck on the cheek. Gutsy and filled with possibility. If I but touch the hem of his clothes, I will be made well. And I was right. 
I figure that's what we're called to as disciples, tiny and great acts of rebellion, the hopeful kind, the life-giving kind, rebellion filled with possibility of a first kiss and undreamable dreams. We're called to be rebels, to bust open the lies that misdiagnose people as outside the reach of God's grace. We're called to trust in the power of our Savior so much that we risk everything to draw near with the faith that we are welcome, wanted even. What if instead of the crowd falling silent and averting their eyes and the disciples saying it was nonsense that Jesus could know that power had gone out from him, what if no one had to ask because I didn't have to take the risk by myself. What if one of those followers was a rebel too, or two of them, or three, and they elbowed and shoved their way to the front of the crowd because after 12 long years, I was really tired. And one shielded the stain on my robe, and another called, Jesus, Jesus, over here, my friend, my neighbor, this stranger that the world calls a liability needs you. What if someone dared to say, enough, get out of the way, and instead of being a barrier to Jesus, the crowd was my bridge. Because let me tell you, it's a heck of a lot easier to be a rebel with a team than all by yourself. Daughter, he said to me, Daughter, I like that, from nobody to family and just one touch. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Let me tell you what going in peace looks like for someone who has spent so long slipping from shadow to shadow. Going in peace looks like finding the largest patch of sunshine in the busiest street and spinning until you're so dizzy you crumble into a pile of your brand new self. Going in peace looks like making such a spectacle of the healed up you, the family of Jesus you, that the crowds who for so long tried to ignore you gather around to hear your story. Jesus is story. Going in peace transforms slinking into dancing. I wonder sometimes if the crowd that day actually knew Jesus, if they were wandering around behind him, or if they were following. Because when I finally knew him, like really knew him, not just the story, but the actuality, the you can't do anything to hide from this grace, so you might as well crumble yourself at his feet truth. When I knew him, I abandoned myself to bowing and to dancing. What if instead of squeezing in so tight to assure their personal close encounter with Jesus that day, the crowd swayed like a mosh pit of invitation, passing the most broken over their heads till they were front and center with the one who could offer them new life. What if they busted out a dazzling routine beyond Jesus loves me to Jesus loves you? Maybe, maybe they weren't like me the new me. Maybe they had gathered but not encountered. Maybe they didn't know that God can transform you from even the tiniest touch of the tip of your finger. Because I figure a life that has encountered Jesus can't hold itself still. Like David, who danced before the Ark of the Covenant, or Miriam, when the Red Sea parted, a life that has encountered God is made for dancing. The kind of dancing that calls the fringe and the skeptics into encounters with holiness. The kind of dancing that an unfolds a testimony of grace, an unabashed spinning of gratitude. Because we are called not to just be the crowd 
but to be the body of Christ, a body that teaches and welcomes and heals and worships, and I believe a body that dances. These 11 verses, they're okay, I guess. But my story is one of rhythm and rebellion. Then again, I guess that's what it means to follow, to really follow Jesus. So how about you? Are you a rebel or a dancer? Yeah, I thought so. Thanks be to God.